Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. This podcast is on addiction and the body. It's kind of a funny time for me to be recording a podcast. It's um, half ten at night, which is normally when I go to bed. It's a Saturday night, and I've done my normal trick of working ridiculously hard for the last six days, and um, then going, oh, shit, I've got no social life. My wife works nights, so um, sometimes I find myself in this position where it's the weekend and I want to do something. And often this podcast, if I record a um, solo one, it's normally kind of almost like a... Um, feel driven to it. I won't say a compulsion because that's a bit close to today's subject, but there's an element of just um, going, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. So um, yeah, this is on, on addiction in the body. I'm fairly well personally qualified for this and this may well be kind of quite a lot of personal stuff in this one. Um, I wouldn't say, no, I'm certainly not an expert on this. I've done a couple of courses on it and a little bit of coaching on it, but it's not my professional domain. Okay. So what's an addiction? Let's start there. Um, There's lots of definitions out there. One I like is there's two criteria for a a full compulsion or addiction to be met. Um, One is that you say you're not going to do it and you do it anyway. So that would be a compulsion. The the clear thing here is the loss of freedom. Yeah. And the other one for for me, for it to qualify as a full-blown addiction um, would be it's really damaging the things you love. So it's damaging um, that which has value to you in your life. Some people say, oh, I've got an addiction to chocolate. And I'm like, well, you know, is it making you morbidly obese? Is it damaging your health? If not, maybe let's call it something else. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, this is all, in some ways, addiction is just part of the human condition. We like what we like and we want more of it and we crave after it. Um, now, the fight or flight response is pretty well known to most embodiment people. But as Buddhists, we also look at craving, tanha, grasping. And this is um, in some ways very similar in the body, usually a kind of tension, off balanceness. You know, this is pretty easy to play with if you want to experience it at a very low level. You know, just pick up on your phone or your computer something that you like. Um, that you, maybe you don't have actual full addictive issues around, but just something you kind of like. And notice if there's a way you will lean towards that image or your breath will stop, or tightness will creep in. And getting that distinction between um, appreciative enjoyment and addictive craving, I think, is key. So the interesting thing about addiction is you stop enjoying the thing. So I was um, an alcoholic for about 10 years, roughly between the ages of 17 and 27. Well, exactly those ages. I was pretty much a nightly drinker. The only time I would not drink myself into unconsciousness um, would be uh, if I was just too ill. Occasionally, I'd have to have a night off for that. And sometimes I'd find that if I was doing an Aikido retreat, I was able to have some time off that um, as well. And I'll come back to that later because it's kind of interesting as an example. Um, so my, um, you know, this is something my dad was a drinker. I won't go too much into his story. Uh, doesn't feel fair, but let's just say that affected my childhood. And um, what to say? I think there is a genetic component to addictions. It seems to be that some people are wired towards them. Now, there's a bit of a debate that goes on as to whether we have um, just one addiction or just more generally... Um, prone to addictive tendencies. Um, My sense is that you can have a sort of primary addiction, but one, it seems to be just wired in a certain way. Uh, And this also relates to trauma, which I'll come to in a bit. So what does that mean? It means that you um, habituate to things very easily. It means you want more of that stimulus, the sort of, you know, I remember even as a teenager, uh, we'd go to parties, me and my friend and you know, we'd get drunk maybe, and then the next day we'd sleep over at these parties, and I'd just wake up, and I immediately just want another beer in the morning. And um, he'd be like, oh, how can you drink? You know, it just looked like at that age, like, oh, I'd have, oh, I'd be with people and then have one drink, and I just I just couldn't do that. I mean, have a, maybe an act of willpower that would take a lot of effort, but it certainly wouldn't last long. And, um, I, you know, one would lead to another. That's why a lot of um, addiction recovery programs, things like 12-step programs, you've probably heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's all sorts of other ones now, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Addicts Anonymous. Um, and they've even spread to like Debtors Anonymous, Under Earners Anonymous, all sorts of other things, Codependence Anonymous. 
and some of which I think are probably more valid than the other, but it's difficult to judge anyone else's addiction. You know, you've got to be careful with that. It's like someone else's pain. Um, but anyway, a lot of these programs will say, you know, don't have the first one. That's their solution, which is an incredibly simple solution. But if you have one and that thing increases your cravings, um, which are very, very bodily things, um, and reduces your ability to say no to another, then you're very quickly on a slippery slope. And whilst you know harm reduction and um, consumption reduction may be helpful for some people, it's certainly my pattern that even with all my kind of cleverness and willpower, both I, I had buckets of loads of both actually, and that's fairly typical for alcoholics. You tend not to, you know, alcoholics tend to be very driven and not, you know, a lot of addicts quite clever people, um, but that's not enough. Um, this is some um, uh, drivenness that comes in and without even with all that cleverness, even without that, with all that, um, you know, having read different books and studied different spiritual traditions or whatever, one always led to more. Yeah. So the cravings were there. Now, the cravings are, are for whatever one's drug of choice are, are extremely powerful for people that haven't. Um, experience this it's, it's really hard to explain exactly how powerful that is in the body um you know if you imagine there's a behavior which will ruin your life and people will do it anyway it they'll you know the the tragedy of addiction is it makes you do things that are, that are against your values including the own your own drinking or drugging or whatever it is um people will do you know see their house get lost they'll see their wife leave they'll hurt their kids you know and for some people there's a point where there's some sort of what's called a spiritual rock bottom and i had in one of these in brazil a year or two before i quit when there was some kids i was looking after and um uh, i was um uh, doing aikido with them but i was um hung over most of the time and they could smell alcohol on me and this was reported and I was brought into the office of someone to talk to about it. And they were they're not trying to shame me or be nasty to me. They just sort of said, look, these kids don't really need this. You know, they've got enough. It was in the slums of Brazil. And these kids have got enough bad stuff in their life without another role model who drinks. And um, I was like, okay, you know, I felt this kind of like deep shame. But I often think of a shame as a bad thing. But I think it can be also good. Like, hey, I've not, you know, I've really not lived up to my own values here. And I didn't quite quit for another couple of years. But that was the point where I went, okay, I'm doing things which profoundly is against my values. You know, I was there to help those kids and um, had a lot of passion for that. Um, but that's what you do when you're an alcoholic addict. The cravings are so strong. Even when you tell yourself, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And you could be telling yourself you're not going to drink right up to the point you walk into a pub and order a beer, you know. Uh, that willpower just doesn't seem to quit it. And that doesn't make sense to people because no, you know, people that don't have that sort of gene or that wiring or that trauma history, whatever causes it, um, find it difficult to imagine that. You know, they just say, I'm not going to drink, and they don't. You know, that being said, um, most people have some kind of compulsive behaviors. So we are looking at kind of a scale here. And, and this, this Buddhist perspective of grasping is something that we definitely all have. Hmm. A little bit of sweet juice here now. This is my, um, I've got hardcore chamomile tea and some sort of green juice to take me through the night. How times change. Um, I just passed my 12th or 13th year sober, by the way. I can't, um, remember which actually now, helpfully enough. <laughs> A bad memory is one of the things that alcoholism left me with. Um, so that, that craving, that feeling in the body, some people will see addiction as essentially as an attempt to self-regulate. Uh, so this is where the kind of trauma conversation comes in. If people have hyperarousal from trauma, listen to the podcast today on trauma or any of the guest ones on trauma, this idea that we um, traumatize people, um, and I certainly had that in my system too, are wired, they're um, uh, buzzing from the hyperarousal, the adrenaline, the cortisol's flowing. And a lot of um, addiction can be seen as an attempt to self-regulate, also attempt to take control. You see that with people who smoke, you know, it's like, even though it's a stimulant, it's relaxing because they're taking control and they're also reducing the um, cravings there, which are making them more relaxed, even if from a different baseline. Um, so yeah, this is why you'll see, you know, addictive behaviors in, in people who are very stressed, where soldiers often smoke, even if it's maybe not great for their fitness or whatever. Um, an attempt to self-regulate, yeah, it can be very reliable, you know, this, so some people will even hear, and you'll hear me say, like, you know, thank God I used to drink, so I might have killed someone, myself or someone else, you know, this idea of, it was, it's that good friend that you just have to open the bottle and it's there, unlike a complicated human being, unlike a difficult spiritual practice or something else that helps you self-regulate, you just have to crack open the cigarettes or the alcohol and it's that super reliable friend, false friend perhaps, which is always there for you. 
Um, and those those feelings of cravings can they are really extreme. You know, it's a hunger that is hard to um, imagine. But also, you know, once you're there, this sort of has its life of its own, and you do things that just totally say you won't do, and you go against your own values. And you, people will literally see themselves homeless, or you know, when, until people hit that sort of spiritual rock bottom, which can be you know just having enough. For me, it was just one day waking up and hangover again. 10 years later, just having enough. I somehow managed to see there was a, um, a point I was going to and I managed to, you know, I wasn't yet a morning drinker. I wasn't yet in hospitals, mental hospitals or prisons like some of my friends in recovery. Um, but I could just see it was only going one way and I could see I wasn't meeting my potential. Interesting for me, somatic practices, um, particularly Aikido, but then later meditation yoga, couldn't really meditate when I was an addict. My brain was sort of too wired, though it can help people in recovery. And was certainly since I got sober, meditation yoga became a great kind of substitute self-regulator. Uh, I really threw myself into it. You know, my um, teacher, Paul Lynn, used to say I was like the energizer bunny when I just got sober and I was at his because I wasn't sedated with alcohol. And he said, I just had this mad hyperactivity like all day long. And I gradually have learned to um, reduce that through trauma work um, that's caused some of the hyperarousal, but also just through um, uh, yoga, meditation, daily practices like that. Even now, you know, I'm exhausted at the end of a long day, but you can you can probably talking quicker than you might might be used to. Sorry to our second language speakers for all the speed. You can listen to these podcasts on half speed. All right, where was I? So um, attempts to self-regulate, yoga and meditation, finding that very helpful um, in early recovery, um, not being able to do it while I was an addict because my head was just still too much of a mess. The, the washing machine head of like constant thinking is something that a lot of addicts will talk about. You know, I was, I was looking at a guy walking down the street, uh, stumbling, and he was shouting at his dog, and he was sort of threatening people. He had a beer in one hand, cigarette that they looks like he was on his way to do a drug deal. You see this quite a lot in Brighton. There's a, a lot of addiction where I live in Brighton on the streets. And this guy, you know, everyone was kind of clearing, well clear of him. His nervous system was shot. I mean, just absolutely shot to hell. And hell's a good word for it. You know, I looked at this guy and I think most people were feeling fear, but because of my experience of addiction, so I can look after myself physically pretty well. I just kind of felt sorry for the guy, you know, I felt really like, wow, the, I was just on my way to yoga. I've been feeling pretty good lately. You know, I've been sort of maximizing my potential as a human being, writing books and getting therapy, doing courses and, you know, all sorts of things. And I went, wow, there, there, that could have been me very easily. And um, the contrast between a human being living to full potential, which is really what I felt like in that moment and someone that's just stuck in hell and that hell is physiological, it's psychological, it's moral. So, you know, this joke that a junkie will help steal your wallet and help you look for it. You cannot trust a fucking junkie. Yeah, you cannot trust an addict. They will do anything for their drug. Their drug is their top priority. And um, particularly if that drug's expensive or difficult to get hold of, their whole life can be built around getting that drug. Um, yeah. But this, 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 the pits of those things. So it's physiological, the hyperarousal. Also, you know, it's an attempt to numb. It's another thing it is. It's just an attempt to not feel. So, so many people coming into addictive backgrounds, you know, have trauma, they have some emotional thing they don't want to feel. And for me, it was interesting when I got sober, there was just so much emotion. Uh, I was so all over the place. And uh, just coming to terms with that was really full on. And um, you'll still see that a lot of addicts, alcoholics, even sober 10, 5, 10 years later, they might have gone from the emotional maturity of like a 15 year old when they start when they started drinking. And they, it's almost like your emotional maturity is on hold. And then let's say they stop drinking at 30. They pick they still got the emotional life of a 15 year old. Uh, some people say, you know, there's even sort of permanent brain damage around that. You know, you have that sort of teenage emotional sense forever. And, you know, I've certainly seen some of my colleagues uh, act a bit teenage at times. And um, now at 40, you know, 10 years sober, I'm probably, you know, more like the equivalent of a 25, 30 year old emotionally. And it's like starting to become more grown up now, just about, you know, because um, you don't develop that emotional maturity when you're an addict because you don't have to because you just drink on everything or drug on everything. You don't when there's an emotional issue, instead of facing it, feeling it, resolving it, you just resolve it by numbing. You resolve it that way that blacks out. Um, you know, another definition of addiction is that's a thing that you have that temporarily solves a problem, but makes that problem worse. Yeah. So it, maybe it soothes cravings, but actually makes you more crazy. 
Um, it makes you feel less stressed about life. But then, you know, when you wake up with a hungover, you're, you, you've you lost time, you've lost money, you've lost health, you've lost resources, whatever, lost friends, don't even know what you've lost sometimes. That's a hard feeling when you wake up and go, what did I do? What did I do the night before? Um, so essentially, addiction is disembodying. Yeah, so it's numbing. It's a disembodying thing. It's a vicious circle because, of course, disembodiment, um, disembodiment leads you to be more easily prone to addiction and addiction makes you more disembodied. So essentially, you're becoming more and more cut off from your body, from your feeling, from your emotional sense, from your own values. And you will have these moments of like stark clarity, sometimes when you're hungover or in the middle of a drunk and you'll see and it will be horrifying um and your your morals your spirituality so sometimes addiction is called cause called a disease of disconnection this disease model is very interesting some people say it doesn't really apply it's you know it's biopsychosocial spiritual which is true but disease is a lot better than the sort of old model of people just like morally weak or something like that um which is why people started using that you know disease model or disease framing starting with people like jung who advised uh, the aa group who was sort of spiritually kind of inspired um a lot of people have a problem with 12 step because it's um spiritual orientated and I found particularly in the States, it can be a bit Christian, but actually the original principles of it is just that you need to have some higher power. Why? Because it puts your ego out of the center of the universe. Yeah. You see, um, addicts, alcoholics, often like me, have this big ego. Big ego, low self esteem is often the thing. And I'm um, putting yourself out of the center of the universe doing service work. You know, this is practicing gratitude rather than resentment. These are classic spiritual practices um, all about changing your head some of what you know is in 12 step could be like prototype cbt like cognitive behavioral therapy but early days reframing things like that um practicing gratitude quiet time meditation again pretty radical in the 1930s so certainly ahead of its time and i can understand people that don't want to have religion forced on them but you know your higher power can be anything it can be the beatles it could be music it could be love it could be the universe as long as it's not you is the joke in aa um, so I'm very grateful for a programs. You might think it's a bit strange that I'm talking about them so publicly. Um, for me, people that are in sort of mid to late sobriety. I think some of that original sort of shame and stigma that was there, which made anonymous really important, um, I think doesn't have to be the case anymore. I think it's probably not good to shout about your sobriety um, in the early days, first few years. But as I think you get more solid in it, you know, it's a day at a time. That's part of the program is you don't, trying to if you try to imagine your life without your drug you've become dependent upon it's really hard because it's like what would i possibly replace that with you know god a program don't be stupid meetings in a church hall um you, you can't imagine that so you just do one day at a time and that's a little psychological trip really helps and that could be anything you know that's a little good little trick for just anything just saying right i'm just doing today and it's always today right it's kind of mindfulness type thing a moment of a time is what some people say not even a day at a time um, so as I said, some people object to the religious component. It's not really religious. It's spiritual. It's a higher power. It's kind of like I see all this resentment towards AA and 12 step. And I think, why are you resentful? There's no it's this anarchistic structure where um, no one's in charge. No one's making money from it. You're not forced to believe anything. I mean, yeah, some people in it can get a bit like quoting the big book of AA, which is like the main text of almost like the Bible and can be a bit full of cliches and things like that. And sometimes people in it misuse it like any group of human beings do. But generally, it's pretty well self-policing. Uh, you know, in, in an age of rampant consumerism, something that's basically free. I mean, you might just put a pound in the pot every time. You don't even have to do that if you've got no money. It's pretty amazing, and it does help a lot of people. Um, that being said, you know, rates of recovery from addiction can be quite low, even with good treatment. And there's different evidence based on what good treatment is. But for example, let's say it was a 12-step program in a treatment center like the Priory is a famous one in England. A friend of mine used to work for that. Um, let's say a treatment center like that, you know, top-end treatment, you might be a third of people die, a third of people are in and out call it swinging tours and a third of people actually recover long term like myself so your odds aren't that great and that's with good treatment yeah so let alone if you know if you're on the streets streets just trying to do it yourself or your family locked you in a room to go cold turkey or something mm. is sugar my last addiction you know sugar's a funny one because a lot of people say oh it's evil it's such a hell it's like well 
when you've seen crack addicts, maybe sugar's not so bad. That being said, there does seem to be kind of one reward pathway for everything. And I, I personally have noticed that I can easily get addicted to Facebook or, um, I don't know, computer games, pornography, uh, arguing with people even, um, certain foods. Uh, I have to be, you know, I have to go decaf because I get caffeine addicted very quickly. You know, I have one coffee when I'm traveling and then I'll be on 10 a day. You know, I've absolutely never want to learn the rules of poker or any gambling for my wife because I know I'll be addicted to that in two seconds. And sometimes addictions can be almost positive, like um, the gym, you know, it's endorphin hits. It's probably my current addiction. And, um, you know, addicts have this drivenness where they can throw themselves into things, which means you get a lot of very successful people financially and in music you'll meet in AA. AA is hilarious, actually. Like, you, you'll be sat next to, like, one guy on your left be a multi-million pound lawyer, and the guy on your right will be, like, a street-drinking, you know, homeless person. You will meet a lot of different kinds of people, but definitely a disproportionate number of successful people, I think, because of that obsessive-driven quality it leads you making podcasts at quarter to 11 at night, for example. Um, so 200 podcasts, yeah? So if it's channeled, that kind of tendency can be quite positive. Uh, the touchiness and the sensitivity is often there long term, that that gets better. For my sense, it's like I have to keep reconnecting with myself, which is the embodiment part, right? If I keep coming back to myself in body practice, this is a foundation of my sobriety. Reconnecting with others, often um, alcoholics, addicts will treat people as means to ends. Um, you'll lose that humanity. You'll become sort of like slightly psychopathic as a sort of temporary tendency. Um, you're not really like that at heart, but that tendency can come in um, and reconnecting with others in community, like with groups or, you know, again, through embodied practice, great way to connect with others. And then some kind of spirit, some kind of higher power. Uh, they're originally going to call it inner power, but because of the Christian sort of um, influence in 1930s America, they call it higher power. Um you know, for me, they're the disconnections, right? They're the main connections we talk about in embodiment, self, other kind of planet or something bigger, the environment. And you do learn through in sobriety to reconnect to those three things. And I can certainly disconnect still to those things. It's a, a daily reprieve, sometimes they call it. And if I, you know, go a week without meditating, without doing embodiment, without going to meetings, it ain't good. It pretty quick. One, two weeks comes back. Um, so it's a maintenance of those things. You know, I go to meetings for the sort of um, communal, you know, I meditate on my own for, for that. I find exercise very helpful for burning off some of that charge, that hyper arousal that so many of us um, addicts have. So you can think of it as a disconnection from spirit, a spiritual malady it's sometimes described as. So there is this spiritual component um, that does seem to be part of it. And I think we all have a spiritual life. And in, in addiction, you learn that it's like, for me as an addict, a lot of the things that are nice to have are mandatory for me, are absolutely mandatory for me to do in terms of some of these practices. And, you know, and, and it's a blessing in a way because it's meant that I've really stuck to these practices. Like, you know, when I first found Aikido, I was still an alcoholic and um, I could see there was something in it that had meaning, you know, there's that disconnection from meaning and connection to self and connection to the other. That's all in Aikido. And I really was drawn to it and I clung to it. And I would notice that I could stay sober if I was doing Aikido for at least for a few days, which is a kind of a miracle when you're an addict. I remember the largest thing was like 10 days and I was doing this Aikido peace project in Cyprus. I think it was 10, 10 days without drinking, which for me was a miracle. Um, but I always went back to the drinking. And in some ways, like, you know, these kind of healthy practices can be enabling. I think it kept me upright. You might think, how can you be an alcoholic and do Aikido? Well, you shake it off and a certain age, I was young and I could kind of get away with it and wake up with a hangover and be fine by lunch. And you know, that was my sort of daily schedule was waking up hungover and drinking loads of water and fruit juice mixed with water and coffee. And then um, sometimes with amphetamines actually. And uh, shaking that off and by lunch being fine at university, I'd be going to lectures every day. You know, it's interesting at university at first, first year, everyone's drinking a lot. And by the second or third year, people go, oh, we might have a night off, Mark. And, you know, they'd sort of, my behavior was hidden. And alcoholics and addicts will often hide their behavior. You know, it's, I found in work environments like ski resorts or environments like um, sort of party environments, like kids centers, you'd be horrified to learn just full of drinking every night. And uh, environments where it was normal to drink a lot, where I could hide that drinking. And, um, yeah, like I said, the martial arts helped and it certainly gave me a vision of another way of being that I needed to do 
the 12 step personally for me to help that for, you know i got read a book as well that had nothing to do with 12 step it was helpful it's one of alan carr's books and i went to like a counselor for a bit that you could get on the government for a while that wasn't that helpful but for some people might be um you know some people really go into religious side of things uh, these different things do work seem to work for different people you know um for some people it's like psychedelic experience can help them i would not classify psychedelics as drugs in the sense of like uppers and downers. We have this one word drug for everything. And that's why some people call them ethogens or medicine, which is a bit pretentious, but I can definitely, you know, I've seen people kind of have realizations on those drugs that can make them see through their addiction. Um, yeah, there's other possibilities for treatment out there. Um, but for me, this, this idea of reconnecting to self, to others and to something bigger, you know, it's, it's almost a definition of embodiment, actually. Talk about embodiment as, as disembodiment is about disconnection, embodiment as about reconnecting. So um, what else helps from the embodiment world? Well, like things like centering, uh, we should look up my pleasure centering. So this is where we center around nice things, not just nasty things. Um, a lot of centering comes from martial arts where it's just looking at fight, flight, like threat, but learning to center around um, cravings is also really important to, again, to self-regulate yourself, um, to get back in touch with yourself so you can get back in touch with others and what you care about. So you don't need this uh, numbing. You don't need this um, uh, a way of um, feeling okay, you know? People do anything for that, that that feeling of ease, that feeling of okay. And that's what addiction really is. There's a desperate attempt to get that. It's just not a very smart strategy because it, it's making the thing worse. That You know, this is like a medicine that makes the problem worse. So that always leads to these kind of cycles. Mmm. And that is good juice. Super green. Kale, spinach, pear, apple, lemon, kiwi, broccoli, banana. Check it out. Okay. Um, Gabor Mate is worth mentioning here. So Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E with the thingy on top. Um, I think it was Chilean originally. Um, Gabor Mate um, really looks at, at how addiction in a social context. So there's this classic study of mice and there's no, it's rats. And um, rats when given, stuck in a cage and they're given a water dispenser and it's got cocaine in or heroin or whatever, they'll fucking go for it. Animals love drugs as much as people do, by the way. Whether it's dolphins with puffer fish or there's all sorts of animals that get high in different ways. Animals that roll down roofs to get themselves feeling, you know, altered states. Anyway, so the rats will get themselves fucked up, basically. Now, everyone thought, well, it's just the substance. You know, the substance itself is addiction. That's all there is to it. But what they didn't realize was rat in a cage, not very happy. So instead, they tried the same experiment with rats in rat heaven. So now the rats have mates, they've got like rats to chill with, rats to have sex with, they're in like rat toys everywhere. It's a sort of big rat kind of mansion house they're in. Give them the same cocaine, they might have a little bit of it and then they just leave it because they don't need it because they're getting regulated other ways. They're um, feeling, uh, you know, getting their social needs met and it, it just becomes less attractive to them. So this these connections between I've mentioned trauma already, but also poverty, inequality, these kind of things, you know, these these are not um, inconsequential for addiction. And there is, you know, quite a kind of radical analysis that can be made of things like drug laws and the kind of people who end up in jail and how that's, you know, disproportionately affected, say, black populations in America. Um, yeah, I think looking at addiction without its sort of full social and political context would be a mistake too. So yes, we can look at it psychologically as obsession. We can look at it physiologically and from embodied, you know, embodied perspective, obviously. Um, but, you know, also looking at it in this, is in this uh, spiritually and in this, this social and political context. Cool. I think I'm getting to the end of my um, stamina for this for now. What else? Embodied yoga, yeah, so um, the embodied yoga principle stuff we do, that can help people, whether it's like letting go or we have a saying no pose, you know, stepping into, or stepping into very particular embodiments that can help someone um, who is in a process of giving up addiction. I had various students say that was useful for them, and st occasionally I still need to use it myself. Um, it's a good repertoire of kind of somatic shifting states that are even more specific than just reducing the fight-flight response. What else to recommend? Um, Claire Meyer, M-A-Y-A-T-T, -T, is a colleague of mine that's written a little bit about this, uh, embodiment and addiction. There's not that much on the subjects, actually, so I hope this has been a um, 
useful introduction. I hope the um, things I've said here have made kind of sense. I think it's something that's it's very common. And as I said, in some ways, like, you know, Russell Brand in his book on 12 Steps and Addiction just says, look, this is just an extension of normal human behavior. He kind of rewrites the 12 steps you may have heard of um, in terms for kind of anyone that applies to any addiction. And, you know, when you go to a, a mixed meeting, like I was at a Butterfield Festival and there's like a mixed 12 step tent there, which is great. There's people with food addictions. I think that one's particularly hard, actually, because you can't not eat, you know, and then um, sex addictions. Yeah, I've looked at that one in myself and basically come to the conclusion that I'm not a sex addict, but I sometimes use sexuality as a way to self-regulate myself. It's been um, 31 days into a kind of celibacy experiment. And by the way, if you want to know you're, if you're an addict or something, try giving it up, you know, for people like to try and give up drinking for January, dry, 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 and they last a week. It's like, maybe you've got a problem. Other people are just like, oh, I'm having a month off. I'm having a year off and it's no big deal for them. You know, it's easy being theoretically not an addict, but when you try to give something up, it's like, is it obsessive? Is it really difficult? And, um, you know, what I found with sexual behavior and it's like all sexual behaviors for me, just as an experiment is basically just like a bit more stress. It's like, okay, I was using that as a sort of regulation way to regulate, you know, which is, is probably pretty common. Same when I've done fasting. Um, it's a great way to see your addictions around food. It's just to stop eating for a few days. You know, obviously you might want to get medical advice on that and drink plenty of water and all the rest of it. But I've done that a few times now, three to five day, um, you know, just water fasts. And it's, it's very liberating actually. So this is the thing. Once you realize that you don't need to have sex, you don't need to eat sugary foods. I've done, you know, sugar free months and stuff as well. And it's, it's like, yeah, oh, I don't actually need that. And that's very liberating. And then when you, do you have it again? You can enjoy it. You never enjoy things with an addiction. So for me, that you know, learning to be non-addicted, um, learning to let go of craving. I mean, a yeah, you have to be enlightened to totally do that, but at least to a greater degree, is actually about enjoying life more. It's there's a, there's a intelligent, informed, enlightened hedonism if you want to it. Um, you enjoy your food more when you know you don't have to get it that kind of way. Um, so this is why I'll do these renuncia experiments. It's kind of almost uncool now to go. A little period without something pleasurable whether it's your computer you know so many people have these phone addictions um appearing more and more uh, young people with porn addictions as well it's one i'm very glad my sexuality was formed before that was invented internet porn um it seems to be this sort of mega stimuli they sometimes call them sugar can be described that way too because you wouldn't have it in a natural evolutionary environment but um yeah, there's something very liberating about it. You know, this idea that the free, to, the pleasure of being free from the addiction is uh, more pleasurable than um, satisfying that craving temporarily because um, it comes with a feeling of freedom as well. And that that's sort of, it's like a lesson I need to keep relearning. You know, it's like, for me, addiction is almost like a disease of forgetting. I forget how good it feels to be just connected to myself and grounded and connecting to others and connected to some sort of spirituality. And then I do it and I go, oh, yeah, this feels great, you know. And then I find myself not prioritizing it until I really need to. And then and these days I get smarter about it. It's almost like, you know, when you feel like you need a shower, it's kind of like that mentally and spiritually for me. And I'm like, okay, I need to, you know go to the woods and reconnect to nature that's kind of prayer for me or um you know go to an a meeting or another 12-step meeting um yeah have a look at russell brand's book on this if you want a kind of fun easy resource um if you're already in recovery i'd say the joe and charlie tapes are really really good if you're um wanting just kind of like classic 12-step stuff but in a kind of humorous intelligent and accessible way there's a whole physiology physiology you can look at as well around you know addictive centers and how it's pretty much the same reward pathways that light up no matter you know what the addiction is mm. Oh, Camel tea. This is the real shit as well, man. This is the, the strong loose leaf bad boy Camel tea. Oh, yeah. I'm not taking that tea bag bullshit. No way. This is the hardcore stuff. Um, so, um, where was I before I went on my little Camel tea addict fantasy? Uh, yeah, so resources. I think there's a few other things out there. You know, there's lots of books, just huge numbers of books actually on this subject. Um, groups, discussion, things online. I'd say, you know, don't believe what you hear about 12-step particularly quite often because it, it's often the people in 12-step are very um, anonymous, very quiet usually, and the haters aren't. So um, you'll find a disproportionate kind of weighting of that way on YouTube and things like that. And I'd say give it a try. You know, if you think you might have a problem, as I say, try giving something up. If you can do it and it's not massively hard or obsessive, then 
you know, if it's not hurting your life, no big deal. Enjoy whatever your thing is you do, your cream cakes or your pornography or whatever, you know. Um, but if it's affecting you, if you can't give it up or when you do give up, you feel loads better and you go, wow, shit, I'm living more according to my values now, then that might be worth looking at. You know, it might be worth um, uh, finding some support from other people. Trying to go it alone is not smart or wise. So, you know, if it's 12 step or professionals, you know, there's Buddhist alternatives to 12 steps as well. I've come across, um, you know, they don't go it alone. And, um, it's funny, you know, when you're in a deep in addiction, it can feel like this is the only way. It's got a way of blinding you to all possibilities. And, um, yeah, I just want to say there is hope and there is possibility. And I've seen lots of people recover, people who were far more addicted, you know, seem far more in it, morning whiskey drinkers and hardcore drug addicts, you know, heroin addicts and the rest of it. I've just heard too many stories of recovery to um, think that it isn't possible and consistently the things that you hear are people taking responsibility that's important if you're like oh i'll have to drink because of the my bad hardship i have to drink because of this i have to drink so that it's like no bullshit so this is really interesting mix of on the one hand surrendering to a higher power saying i'm powerless and on the other hand this um key taking key responsibility yourself not using excuses um you know they talk about resentment being the chief offender so it's kind of like not allowing yourself to have resentment, practicing gratitude, practicing the mindfulness, um, helping reframe some of that stinking thinking. There's lots of these like little sort of cliche things in 12 step, but they, the more I've done in it, you know, 12, 13 years later, the more I go, okay, there's a lot in this, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in this. And some of the arrogance I had of trying to do it all my own way is, um, yeah, that's diminished now, if I'm honest. Um, service work's a big part of AA. Again, putting your own ego out of the way, doing things to help others. You know, you can, addicts and alcoholics can be very selfish, uh, myself included. So it's like, you know, consciously practicing not doing that. And as I said, embodiment, I think, can be a part of this, you know. Um, Aikido gave me a way to stay healthy enough to keep going until I could sort my problem out. It gave me an alternative uh, like an alternative picture of what it meant to be human and in sobriety the yoga meditation really gave me um um tools for living for handling myself and tuning in somatically to what is that like black hole of addiction the black hole of craving like what is that and actually tuning into that somatically and hanging out with my own feelings and learning to be present in my own body so I didn't have to keep jumping out of it. And I'm, in some ways, even though I'm an embodiment teacher, I think I'm still playing catch up for 10 years of numbing. So, um, yeah, hopefully I'll be back where most of the human race is if I do enough of this embodiment stuff. And um, as I said, there's hope. And I feel a bit vulnerable kind of speaking about this stuff so publicly, but I've, I've also learned that it's important to speak the truth it's important that's part of my own recovery actually it's important to um put yourself in a way that other people can hear so you know i don't like to push this on ever on anyone and it's very much like you know if you've made it this far and 37 minutes in you've interested in the subject right um so been this interested in the subject sometimes people email me and they say hey can you sort out my son or my husband or my wife and i'm like nope they have to message me you know they have to reach out to me and normally i just say find a 12-step group Maybe find a sponsor, normally same sex we recommend. Um, I did have a female sponsor for a while. If you're out there, you know who you are. Thanks for your help. And um, yeah, you know, find some other people that, that can help you with, you know, whatever the thing it is. You're not alone and um, there is shit you can do about it. So um, yeah, take responsibility for that and do what you can. All right, that's enough of me rambling. It's kind of late here. I should probably practice some of that self-care stuff I'm always teaching. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less 
less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on EmbodiedFacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up, and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list, and get involved on the Facebook. There. Whew bit long uh, pick whatever you like that works for you until next time welcome home to the body